Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the trustees and volunteers of the National Museum of Computing, I would like to welcome you to this, which is the second in a series of three lectures celebrating the 100th anniversary of Alan Turing's birth. Uh, those three lectures are an initiative linking up three top museums of computing in the world. And I'd like to thank my colleague and fellow trustee Kevin Morell for being instrumental in putting this whole program together. It's a delight that we've been able to participate. Um, our friends at the Computer History Museum uh, in Mountain View in California started the series on the 7th of March uh, with a lecture by George Dyson entitled Turing's Cathedral. Uh, that's now online and available on YouTube, as indeed this video will be of this event this evening in due course. The third lecture will be on the 26th of May. That's hosted by our friends at the Heinz Nixdorf Museums Forum in Paderborn in Germany. And that will discuss the pioneering work of uh, Zuse and comparing that with the work of Turing. But tonight is the second in the series. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce to you your chairman for the evening, respected broadcaster and journalist, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Thompson. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been to Bletchley Park, to the National Museum of Computing many times. I was trying to cast my mind back. I think the first time was about 14 or 15 years ago when I came with Quentin Cooper, fellow journalist, to do a programme called The Big Bite. And things have changed so much since then. I mean, obviously transformed. Every year I come back and there's more great stuff to look at. Uh, and it's really fantastic to be here for this evening for such an important event commemorating Alan Turing's 100th birthday. Uh, we have, as they say, a packed programme for you. Um, and I believe there's a, an agenda slide coming up. So we're going to start off with a video that NPL have made um, about Turing's work there. Um, after that, Simon Lavington's going to talk about Turing's life and times and his contemporaries. And then we have the, the joy of Kevin's demonstrating the pilot ace. And I understand going to teach all of us how to code it. Uh, obviously the exam will take place in the bar later um, and anybody who doesn't score above 75% won't be allowed any beer. That seems only fair, don't you? So you have to pay enormous attention. So we're going to kick off with the video, uh, which I believe involves dimming the lights and doing all sorts of things, so I'm going to go and sit down while that happens. You are living in the beginning of the information age. Our whole world is powered by computers, machines which do billions of calculations every second. But only 70 years ago, computers were human beings. Until, that is, Alan Turing invented a machine that could do the work. Turing first came up with the idea of a computing machine to solve a key mathematical problem of the day. Not content to leave this on paper, he was soon planning to turn it into a real, working computer. However, the war was to delay his plans, and it was only when he was asked to join the National Physical Laboratory that he could begin to design in earnest. Design what was to become the pilot, automatic computing engine. After the war, Alan Turing, who had been working on breaking the German codes at Bletchley, joined the mathematics division when it was formed at NPL in 1945. Well, most of NPL didn't know that he'd been involved in this code-breaking work during the war. Totally Still secret. Too hush -hush. Absolutely, it was hush hush for another, oh, long after he'd left NPL. Mm. Nobody was supposed to talk about it or those that knew about it. And moreover, his qualifications included experience of electronics. And again, nobody knew at that time that there was going to be an electronic computer. That was just not mentioned. Until 1946. A complete description by Alan Turing was put before the executive committee of the NPL and they approved it in a month later. 
the mathematics division expanded and included a team dedicated to getting the computer built. Turing, however, developed a reputation amongst his colleagues of being a bit difficult. Jim Wilkinson and I were recruited by Goodwin to join the new division and uh, Jim was to work half-time on developing numerical methods and half-time to work with Turing. Now, most of the time he'd work with Turing, but uh, Turing could have an off day when he was in a real, uh, really foul mood and Jim would, would uh, decide that was a good day to go and work f with for his other half. Turing had these, these moods, but they would usually pass. They didn't mean too much. Uh, you just had to weather the storm and get on with something else. Though Mike Woodger, as Turing's assistant, got to know a very different side to him. He was so gentle and uh, he was a very private man and I was very shy. It turned out, although he had all this experience, he was a very shy man too. In fact, the other day I came across a letter I thought I'd lost. See, when I joined in 1946, most of the August, I was away, sick, because I, I picked up a glandular fever. Both Wilkinson and Turing were away on one reason or another uh, from the lab. And then they realized, Turing realized that I was going to come back and there'd be nobody to supervise me, you see. Well, being the man he was, he wrote an absolutely charming letter uh, so apologising for them not being there, and a list of things I might do. And knowing that I was probably feeling a bit, a bit weak with a glandular fever, he said, you know, read a book. <laughs> or this, this and this, various, various kind of suggestions. It turned out that Turing's time at MPL was to be brief. He left after two years, frustrated at the slow progress on a prototype of his design, the Pilot Ace. Morale on the project collapsed. And construction only got a second wind when MPL's electronics section offered to help, coming together with those in mathematics to build the hardware. Though Jim Wilkinson was now in charge, Turing had left a strong legacy. There wouldn't have been a pilot ace without Turing. He produced, astonishingly, a complete description of a machine and we used that and went on from there. It was sufficiently complete for him to know what to do next. Now that's, that's astonishing, utterly astonishing. They had a working computer. That was immediately put to use. It wasn't supposed to be used for calculating, but that was what Jim wanted, and that's what happened. I knew Jim from 1941, knew him well. I only once knew him upset. And that was when he'd been to a meeting over here where they were discussing what to do with the pilot ace. Uh, and what the proposal then was that we should abandon it and get on with building the full scale ace. Uh, and he, he was really cross about this. And he tackled Goodwin, uh, who knew of potential customers. And between them, they, they, they built up the case for retaining it. It was a going concern, calculating. And that's why uh, Jim Wilkinson was interested in speeding all that up by a factor of 100 or so. And that's the impact that the pilot has really made. That it was this fantastically fast computer. And Turing was very keen on the speed. He was prepared to sacrifice a lot in the design for the sake of it being as fast as possible. The Pilot Ace was finally finished in 1950 and unveiled in a three-day public and press extravaganza. They refer to it as the MP Electronic Brain, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, they're asking here in the press release for anyone who knows what use they could make of it, any problems they would like solving, touting for business. Good Lord. This is it. Did you actually operate from here, Tom, were you...? This was the operator's <laughs> desk, and uh, it, it was very user friendly The Pilot Ace became the first computer available for hire. Work flooded in from those in government and industry, desperate to do their calculations in a fraction of the time. Much of the custom came from Britain's burgeoning aircraft industry. A big test for the computer came with one of the first passenger airline disasters. 
It had to calculate the cause of the mid-air explosion of a Comet aircraft, which killed 35 people. No Comet has flown with passengers since January, for in that month, Yoke Peter, the Comet which smashed all records on a flight to Johannesburg four years ago, crashed with the loss of 35 lives. Yoke Peter took off from Rome Airport on schedule. A few minutes later, the plane exploded. The ships of the Royal Navy hastened to the spot, but there were no survivors. Immediately, BOAC grounded all comets, and the search began for the wreckage. Thus, the most extensive investigation of its kind ever held was started. Thinking part of its shell had burst, they placed another comet in an enormous tank of water and took measurements of the pressure on the aircraft. It was up to the pilot Ace to calculate where the metal had cracked. Eight million multiplications was a small part of the job. That's a lot of multiplying, 8 million. <laughs> um, and eventually, uh, we found the answer to the comet disaster. Britain salutes the backroom boys who have spared nothing to solve the comet mystery and to put the record-breaking airliner back in the forefront of modern aviation. It earned, what, thought, 100,000 pound. Now, that seems peanuts to you people these days, but I think my salary is probably five or six hundred pound a year. We were earning money from testing thermometers, maybe a penny a time, or taxi meters, a pound a time maybe. Uh, we earned a lot from our ship tank, but this was big money uh, as far as the lab was concerned. Once we realized what we were capable of doing, people got to hear about it, uh, and uh, this was the only machine around we, we, we just filled up. It was all very new to them, what the machine could do. It was very new to us. I could do multiplication in 15 seconds on a Brunswiger, and if I could find a machine that did it in 13 seconds, I, could, I was pleased to have it. And suddenly, I can do it in a 500th of a second. You know, it's a big impact. It's, it's the, 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 this, the revolution, uh, information revolution, was very different from the Industrial Revolution, which lasted over many years. Think of how much quicker a train has got over the last hundred years. Not a lot. Think of what's happened in computing, how much quicker, quicker they've got in a short time. And this, this short time it was about five years. I mean, we're seeing, still seeing the effects of it. It was a real revolution. Um, that gave us one view. Uh, I think the NPL may possibly have you know, wanted to, us to think that you know, they were the most wonderful thing that ever happened in the world. Uh, I suspect we'll get a slightly different context and a broader context from Simon Lavington now.